All right, everybody, I've got right at noon Eastern, so we're going to go ahead and get started with uh, our presentation today. We're talking about reviews and your service drive and how reviews drive business, and they also drive service and a culture of service in your dealership. Before we get, uh, get too far into the presentation, I want to do some quick housekeeping. Every good meeting starts with housekeeping, and here's ours. This is a one-way webinar. You can hear me. Hopefully, you can hear me. I can't hear you. So uh, I'm going to ask that you take down my contact information. I'd, I'd love for this to be a dialogue. I'd love for you to be able to uh, engage deeper with these concepts. We, we are going to be moving very quickly today because there's a lot of information to present. So I, we are going to move quickly, and I want to make sure you have my contact information should you need to get a hold of me after the call. Everybody from Dealer Raider is excited to help um, in my area of expertise. I'll be glad to jump in with you, or I may refer you to somebody if you need something. Uh, but definitely want you to know that we do care about your business. We care about you, and, and I know a lot of folks on this call are uh, our Dealer Raider customers, so thank you for joining. And uh, that said, this isn't going to be specifically about Dealer Raider. I, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not excited about doing that. I'm excited about showing you what's going on in the industry and excited about some of the changes that are happening and some of the ways that you can capitalize on those. So without any further ado, let's move forward. Here's your agenda. I'm going to give you today four yeses, four ups, and one down. Uh, those are going to come from a couple of friends of mine in the industry. Nick Santacero, you see him on the left. Nick is a service advisor at Cardinale Way Mazda in Mesa, Arizona. does a great job. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more about him, and you'll get to know him a little bit better as we move through the presentation. And also Megan Bartow from Sioka Honda. I've got to know Megan uh, through a couple different interactions, through Digital Dealer, through driving sales, a few of the uh, industry conferences, and think the world of Megan. She's uh, very, very bright, and I think you'll benefit from hearing some of the tips and hints and strategies that she is utilizing in her dealership. Now, I'm also a giant Cardinals fan, and I'm, uh, I'm sharing this webinar with you today from Boston. So we had lots of fun interaction during the World Series. This is a baseball-themed presentation for you today. So uh, you're going to get to see some of my favorite Cardinals players. Why give you a number when I can give you the jersey? Here's Ozzie Smith, number one, and he brings us our first do. You have to understand what is reputation management. Unfortunately, in our industry, that, that term gets thrown around a lot, and I wanted to uh, have you, help you understand that a little bit. So let me get started with this. And I know you can't, you can't talk to me, but I'm, I'm hoping you're thinking of this. Can you give a good definition of the word run, three-letter word, just three letters, and I can hear the consternation from some of you. There's lots of definitions of the word run, right? We can't give just one. If we had 644 people on this call right now, you could all have a different definition of that three-letter word and have the exact, and I'll be right, even though you have different meanings. So it's very important for you to know that reputation management has really become the same thing. Let me, let me give you some examples here. Alarm clocks run, right? but so does a jogger. You can run a fever, different use of the word run. Boaters often, or hopefully not often, <laughs> occasionally will run aground. If we've got any boaters, this is a fear, running aground. Ladies, you can get a run in your hose. My Cardinals uh, score walk-off home runs. And the guys uh, from Chicago, hopefully we've got some Chicago dealers on the call today, they, they get really excited if they just score a run. So uh, can't, can't be a Cardinals fan and not take opportunity to poke at the Cubs. You could run for office. You can run your mouth. You could run someone down verbally, right? You could run someone down with a car. Cash for Clunkers brought in lots of run-down cars. I know in some of our service departments we see those as well. Noses run. Eggs run, and I have a picture of Pepto-Bismo here in my presentation. So hopefully you get the point. Reputation management really is like that word run. The, the term has become this catch-all, this junk drawer that we use in the industry, and oftentimes as a vendor, uh, I'll own this, we use that word when we've got a product we want to sell to a dealership. So a lot of things are getting lumped in under reputation management that, that frankly don't fit a real definition, a real working definition for you. Merriam-Webster's Learner's Dictionary defines reputation as the common opinion that people have about someone or something. It's the way in which people think of someone or something. They define management as the act or process of controlling and dealing with something. So when we marry those two terms together, we get reputation management. It's the act or process of controlling and dealing with the common opinion that people have about you. 
Now, if I had my own learner's dictionary, I would add real reputation management. I think ma real reputation management is the management of your store. You as a manager controlling the actions and processes that happen internally that your staff are, are doing and how it affects that common opinion that people have about you as a dealership. So real reputation management is managing the actions and the process that drive your reputation. Your reputation is owned by the consumer, not by you in a lot of ways. They're the ones that share who you are. They're the ones that talk to their friends about who you are and how you do business. So the only real way you can manage that is by managing the actions and processes. Let's take a little bit, uh, a little deeper dive into that. Before we start talking about how we're going to control those actions and processes, we need to understand where we are. It's always good to know where you are if you want to get to where you're going. So our, uh, our second jersey here, number two, you have to understand the importance of your reputation to your future sales and service. Back in November of 2012, Gallup did a poll where they reached out to Americans and asked them for their perceived honesty and the ethical standards of 22 different professions. They do this, they've been doing this for 30 some years. They reached out and just as an example, when they asked, they asked the average American, how does a nurse rate as far as their ethical standards? They rated the highest at 85% of Americans saying that a nurse had a high score, an average score of 85%. So what percentage do you think car salespeople received? And I won't let you dwell on this too long before I share the answer. It wasn't 85. It was actually 8. Car salespeople are at the bottom of the list, the very bottom of the list. Now, what I want you to look at is the date signature here on this Gallup poll. It was November 26th through 29th of 2012. If you think about what was going on in November of 2012 and you look at how car salespeople ranked against members of Congress, it should shock and alarm you. There was tons of mudslinging ads going on. Millions of dollars were being spent to make members of Congress look bad so that uh, other members of Congress or those that would buy for those seats would win those elections. And car salespeople ended up below them. What's worse than that, when asked, Gallup said this, car salespeople have been at the bottom of the list every year except for 2011 when they tied with members of Congress at a 7% honesty rating. Car salespeople's perceived honesty has never climbed out of the single digit range in the history of the list. But that's sales, right? We're, we're focused on fixed ops. Of course, it's absolutely different. The consumer feels differently about fixed than they do about sales, right? Maybe not. Uh, I would encourage you to use Twitter if you don't. Twitter is like a, a, a really great opportunity to pull a bunch of people you're never going to meet into a room and poll them about things. I went out to Twitter and did a search for the word dealership, and these are some of the things that I found. Uh, and you don't have to look very long at this list to, to understand that we may be in that same boat as sales. Likely we are. Uh, there are independent repair facilities that are actively working hard to discredit you as a dealership. Uh, they want nothing more than for consumers to feel like you charge too much for your parts and service and that you're not going to treat them well. And they can get the same service from a different provider. And those are the things that we're trying to work on. I, I really want to draw attention to this one at the bottom, and, and I don't have an answer for this, but I want to pose the question. When a consumer says that, you know, when their response to the dealership is that I'm just, you know, I don't need a $750 laundry list of maintenance items, I, my car is running fine. I think we need to look at that MPI sales process, and I'm not picking on that company in particular, uh, but I do think there is something to look at there. We need to, we need to value the consumer and help to reach them where they stand, not, uh, not where we want them to be. I would encourage you to think about the impact on your reputation of giving them that laundry list of things they may want to fix later on down the road and not gauging that with a certain level of priority. How important is trust? About.com, most of you probably know About.com. In July 2012, they did a trust factor study. And what they said was 84% of respondents would not engage with a brand until they had a certain level of trust established. I, there are newer studies that share the same, same sentiment, but I use this one because I like the quote from Laura Salon here. With the high volume of information at consumer's fingertips, not only is trust a valuable filter, it becomes a prerequisite for consumers to even enter the purchase funnel. And that's purchase of the car or purchase of service. If they don't have a level of trust established, they're not likely to engage with you at all. And that's something we definitely need to think about as we look at this, uh, this idea of how do we engage our service department in building reviews and building a culture of reviews. 
Now I've been talking to you for about 10 minutes, and I know it probably feels like I'm, I'm launching water balloons at you from Boston, and, and you're probably a little irritated with me throwing all this bad news at you. But I, I want to share with you there's, there's good news, too. I really believe that some of the stats, some of the things I've shared with you in the last few minutes present a terrific opportunity for you if you're on the call. L let me explain. If you go out to Google, and I would encourage you to do this on your own. Please don't take my word for it. If you go out to Google and you look at trends data, you can access trends. Uh, they kind of change the layout of the site, but up in the top right-hand corner, you'll see six boxes. Click on that, and that'll drop down a bunch of options for you. You can find trends, and that's your, right, your way of looking to see what other consumers are, are searching for, and you can find that information there. So I would encourage you to look for auto repair reviews. Look for auto body reviews. Replicate this search that I've done. Uh, there is a straight up climb. This is a, a growing trend of consumers looking for reviews specific to auto repair and auto body. On the far right hand side, uh, I've clicked the forecast button because I want to see what Google thinks is going to happen. And you can see they don't see any waning of this. They see it continuing to grow. The dotted lines you see on the far right are what Google predicts will happen with these search terms. This is a big, big opportunity for you. Here's why it's an opportunity. I, I showed you the Twitter research that I did, and I think uh, just anecdotally we know from the Gallup poll and from talking to people, uh, dealerships are not often the most trusted, right? So when a consumer sets out to do business with you, it's kind of like uh, entering the low expectations dating service. The reason this is a great opportunity is you can be Brad Pitt amongst a bunch of non-Brad Pitts, or pick your, you know, pick your Pick your interest. It doesn't have to be Brad Pitt. That's just the one that gets put into all of my presentations because that's who my wife favors. So uh, it could be anybody. But you get to look great amongst a lot of other people that don't look so great. And that's the opportunity before you this morning. I'll show you Dealer Raiders Service Center page. We actually, and hopefully this highlights the, uh, the necessity of this, we looked at some of the same trend data that I just showed you. We looked at what consumers are asking for. And we made a conscious decision to separate out those service reviews so that the consumer can access them quickly and easily. They, they are actively looking for this content and they want to focus on it. We needed to give it to them in order to satisfy the consumer element of Dealer Raider. And uh, that, that really should be a great boon to you. Uh, now again, not a thinly veiled sales pitch. I hope you don't feel that way. But I do want you to recognize how important those service reviews are to the consumer. So much so that a site with a, with a 12, 13 year history like Dealer Raider has made this massive change within the last uh, within the last quarter. Number three. Now we're going to start talking more about. Let's get more tactical. We've talked a little bit about the the big picture. I'd like to talk more about the strategy and more about the tactical implications of this. So number three, a Beltran jersey. Make it personal, and you need to make it personal not just for the for the uh, consumer. We need to make it personal also for the employee. Let me introduce you or reintroduce you to Nick Santacero here. Again, service advisor, Cardinal Way Mazda. He has over 200 reviews in the last 24 months. This is just in the last 24 months. Uh, 200 reviews. He's leading his dealership. He beats out every salesperson and every other service advisor for amount of content. Nick is a great guy. He does a great job. I asked him, how do you make this personal? And I wanted you to hear what Nick had to say. What I like to do is just ask the clients if they would do me a personal favor uh, and let them know that the dealer reader is a very important to both myself and to the dealership, and if they wouldn't mind taking a few moments to do a review on me, then I would greatly appreciate it. It appears that I get some overwhelming responses of yes to that question. When Nick asks a customer for a review, he always makes it personal. It's always a personal favor because what Nick has realized and what Nick knows is that the consumer is not necessarily reviewing the dealership as much as they are reviewing him. He's a, he is a person at the dealership. He's a person that works at the dealership. But their interaction, the face of the dealer, is Nick. He's the one that took care of them and met their needs, right? So he asks for a personal favor, and that would be the first thing I would ask you to write down if you're taking notes in today's discussion. Uh, we need to make it personal. It needs to have, uh, you need to have the employee excited about asking for their reviews. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Here's a quick tip from Megan. Megan says begging for a five-star review is a little like wearing a bread suit to the beach because you want to see the seagulls. The results are problematic. You, you may get what you want, but what you want may not have been what you really needed. 
you don't need to wear a bread suit to engage with the seagulls. And her point is simply we don't need to ask every customer for a five-star review. We need to ask for the story. Reviews are stories. They're, they're not five-star reviews. And a five-star review without a story behind it really has absolutely no value to that consumer. They don't care about the star count. They care about uh, what happened and why you rated them that way. They may not give the same rating for the same kind of experience, so it's important that they hear about your experience. You need to coach your customers towards leaving you their story, not just a five-star review. I'll, I'll show you a few slides of some five-star reviews. And again, not, not pointing fingers, but I will say this doesn't have a whole lot of value. If you found them to be very helpful and informative, infora, that's not going to actually do a whole lot for me as a consumer if I'm thinking about doing business with your company. Here's another example, uh, my, and one of my favorites. Five or four stars in this case without a story, not applicable is just about right. Uh, that has no application at all to a prospect of yours. If you share four stars and give them no reason to understand or, or get any insight into why those stars were given, it doesn't have the same value. It really has no value to them. Real reviews are stories. They're not stars. I know this is going to be a little small, but uh, I wanted to show you the contrast. We've got three, four, and five-star reviews on the right-hand side with very, very little text. On the left-hand side, we have a single review. It happens to be a Yelp review. But a, a single review with a one star and a story. And I can read through that and I can tell exactly what happened and why that review was given. Five words and five stars is not going to help you to sell or service cars. We need to be asking and striving for stories. We need to make that content believable by capturing what's really happened and uh, how the customer feels about you through a story, not just through a star count. Hopefully that makes sense. The other way we need to make this personal, and I know we've got a lot of managers on the call, so I'm speaking specifically to managers at this point. You need to provide some with them, some what's in it for me to your employees. And I'm not talking about hand-holding or babysitting. I'm talking about being smart and using those resources that you have at your disposal to accomplish your goals. You absolutely need to provide for them a reason to make it personal. They need that what's in it for me. Here's what Nick has to say about his personal reviews, and this is the story that you need to uh, need to be sharing with your service advisors and with your salespeople. I'll let you hear what Nick has to say about differentiation. Just because of the DealerRater program, I have had clients that have not only recommended me and recommended that their friends go on the DealerRater site to take a look at the reviews that I have been given, but I have also had clients, and several, I might add, that came in purely because of my dealer rater status, and I, I'm, I'm quite proud of that. There would be uh, clients that have gone on the dealer rater program to review our dealership to see whether they wanted to do business with us, and they've seen so many positive reviews from myself that uh, they actually not only came into the dealership to do business with us, but asked for me specifically because they've had an opportunity to review me that a lot of people come in and they say that they've read so many of my reviews that they almost feel like comfortable with me. One lady said to me, this many reviews can't be wrong. You can hear it in his voice, and I, I wish I could have captured the entire interview uh, that I did with Nick. You can hear that his reviews are a personal point of pride. He takes pride in asking his customers, and he alludes to that here. Uh, if I do a good job, I don't have any problem asking a customer to write a review for me. If I don't do a good job, the last thing I want is for that customer to have an opportunity to write a review for me. Reviews drive a culture, and that's an important part of what's going on here. Nick's reviews really are his meet and greet, and from a service perspective, he feels like by sharing his review content, it can overcome some of the challenges he has for collecting on customer pay, for getting customers to agree to different things outside of warranty. There's a lot of ways that he utilizes that review content. And really what it comes back to is, Mr. Customer, you don't have to take my word for it. I want you to see what other people just like you have had to say about doing business with me. And that's really all Nick needs to say in order to overcome a lot of those objections. It allows him to differentiate, which is a very powerful thing that happens within your store. Let's talk for a second about behavior modification. It's like potty training a puppy. Uh, I use that example lovingly. I don't mean any disrespect by it. But if you think about how you, if anybody's ever got a puppy, the first thing you do is you go out and buy a bunch of books on how do I potty train this monster so that it doesn't uh, you know, do bad things in the house. And what it, every single one of those books, what they talk about is not yelling, not chastising, not uh, pinning up the puppy. It's about positive reinforcement. 
that's what motivates that uh, this puppy in this case in order to do the things that we want them to do as opposed to the things that we don't want them to do. And it's not just puppies that this works with. Positive reinforcement of those activities that you want to encourage is a great way to move the needle on review collection. You need to recognize uh, that it's important. That's probably the first thing. And I've got some simple ideas for how do we make it personal for your employees. And again, I'm not advocating babysitting, and I'm, I'm certainly not advocating uh, you recognizing them for just doing their job. But sometimes that is the way uh, that you can motivate them to go above and beyond. Here's some simple examples. If you read reviews at your team meetings. If you're not doing this, you absolutely should be. When you have a good good review come across that tells a story, you need to you need to be sharing that with uh, with the entire team so that everybody knows what a great job everybody else is doing, and that'll motivate everybody to perform better. It is kind of a group think in that in that regard. If somebody gets an accolade, somebody gets recognition for having done a good job, then the rest of the team is likely to want to repeat that so that they can get that recognition and that accolade. Post great reviews in your break room. You should absolutely be proud of those. Post those up. Email the really good ones to the whole team. Managers on the call, and, and I hope we have some general managers on the call or those that would have the ear of them too. You should be reading every review that comes across for your business. You absolutely should. The insights there are terrific. Uh, I would encourage you to do that, and it doesn't take much. If you, if you have a good review that comes in, we actually do this. Uh, I do this personally. Um, we, and I'll, I'll share with you, uh, we have some great reviews out on driving sales for Dealer Raider. Uh, DrivingSales.com does allow uh, dealerships to rate vendors. And uh, we've, got some, we've got a lot of great reviews, but I, I make a point of sharing those across the entire company when they come in. So when Dale Decker does a good job, He's one of our, he does a great job as one of our support people, but when a review comes in with Dale's name on it, our whole company knows. And everybody from the senior VPs down comment on that and thank Dale for his efforts because they know that he represents Dealer Raider to you. Dale becomes the face of Dealer Raider. So what we want for you to take away from this is you, hey, you have to make it personal. You have to share those success stories internally. I love the idea of throw a contest, too. It doesn't have to be a contest for money. I think that's one of the big misconceptions. We don't need to spit for this. If you have a coveted parking spot, if you, have, uh, if you provide food for your team on Saturday, why not make the goal of one of your contests be to be the first person through the line or not have cleanup duty or not have lot duty? There's a lot of different creative things that you can do focused on a good customer experience and a good customer story. High fives are free. I, I know on the uh, webinar sometimes these are a little challenged. I hope you can see this animated GIF here of, uh, of high fives are free. Um, you sh if this is happening in your dealership, fix it today. Your team shouldn't be the one giving themselves a high five. That's not nearly as motivating as you as a manager coming in and giving them the same high five, right? If they're high fiving themselves, then you've missed an opportunity. Recognize the effort recognize the value that it brings to your team, and recognize that the consumer sees it. And giving a high five is not, uh, not a hard chore for a job well done. Creating a culture is a big part of what Nick talks about, and it's where a lot of our conversation is centered. And, and I know you can kind of feel it going that way. When we talk about reviews driving business and service, I, I intentionally use a double meaning of that word. What we're really talking about is the customer experience. We're talking about that, that customer service that's driven from a review culture. We've already conquered this on the sales side. What we've found is that fixed ops has been a little bit slow to adopt some of the strategy of asking for reviews and letting that govern the customer experience uh, across the dealership. So let me share what Nick has to say about creating a culture. I have been in this business for 36 years. I've done just about everything that there is to do in this business. But I think it comes from within. I am the type of person that I want to be the best. I want to shine. I want everybody to remember my name. I want to be at the top of the pile in everything that I do in my professional career. So I encourage everyone to try to be the best at their dealership. In order for them to be proud enough to want to hand a customer a dealer rater, they have got to give them that customer great service. No one is going to intentionally and an unhappy customer a dealer rater card. So I think it's going to encourage them to step their game up to the next level. If they want to see five after five after five, they want to hear how great they are in print, then they're going to need to they're going to need to strive for that. But if you're going to want to pass those cards out with pride, you're going to want to do a better job. But I think it's credentials. I think the more accolades you have and the more you're celebrated for what you do for a living, the more successful you're going to be and the more successful that the people around you 
are going to want to step up to your level as well. Success breeds success. I hope you hear in, in Nick's voice how much of a strategy this has been for him and how impactful it's been to him at his, uh, at his dealership. Okay, so the, to the heck, the heck with the circumstances, let's create some opportunities. I wanted to show you the opportunity before you. This is NADA data from 2012. There were 13,700 ROs written at the average dealership in 2012. And up at the top right-hand corner, you see the dollar amount associated with that. 13,700 to keep with our baseball theme, that's a ton of at-bats with a, a really, really bad batting average on the number of reviews that are coming out of service departments. We have a lot of opportunity to, uh, to engage. Are you going to get a review from everybody? No, probably not. Are you going to get a review from half of them? I, I doubt that. How many times do we have to cut this in half before it has impact on your business? You can cut it in half a bunch of times and still get down to 107 reviews, which is more than about 90% of dealers on DealerRator have right now for their service department. So there is a lot of opportunity here. I would encourage you to start thinking about review absorption rate. We talk about absorption rate from a financial perspective, but what are we doing with it as far as our, uh, our reputation effort? I think that you need to go to your service department and say, look, 13,000 ROs in the average year? That's a lot of opportunity for you to help us win customers for service and for sales. We need to have a dedicated effort in our service departments to make review collection and make, uh, online, make that online reputation something that tangibly happens in your service drive as well as on your sales floor and out of your parts department and every other department in your dealership. Service reviews have to be on your radar. They, they really need to be. More opportunities. There's, you see more people out of your service department than you see on the sales floor. They're, they're there with greater frequency. You're seeing the same people servicing their car. shouldn't be that hard after you've seen them three or four times, right, to uh, ask them for a review. They know you're going to do a good job. You know what kind of review they're going to give you. There's a growing interest, as we talked about, in that trend data. People are going to Google, and they're searching for information on service-related reviews. You have the opportunity today to be an early adopter to be somebody that's beating the rest of, uh, not only the rest of the dealerships in your area to the punch here, but you need to think about who your real competitor is. And, and this is one of the challenges that we faced this morning too. If you're a Ford store, Ford, if the other Ford store across the, uh, across the way is probably not your competitor. As much as that independent repair facility, the Firestones, the Pep Boys, uh, those are the people that are really uh, taking, taking a lot of uh, revenue away. That $80 billion is a significant chunk, right? That only represents franchise from NADA. The actual estimate on that business is somewhere around $284 billion. So it's a substantial amount of market that you stand to capture if you can diffuse and defeat that negative reputation that the independent repair facility is trying to peg you with is more expensive or uh, less in tune to your needs. Number four. Leverage your service reviews, and we'll go through this really, really quickly. You need to think like a collector. If we're doing all this work of bringing in these reviews, you can see the contrast here. Do I take a valuable coin and put it in a glass jar and put it on a shelf somewhere where nobody's going to see it? That could be thousands of dollars worth of collectible coins in there, and nobody knows but me. If you think like a collector, every coin has its own sleeve. Every one has its own presentation, and that as somebody that doesn't collect coins, I can tell from looking at this picture that some of these things have value because of the way they're displayed. The same thing holds true for your reviews. If you're displaying your reviews, if you're showing them off, if every client interaction begins and ends with, I want you to see what other people have had to say about doing business with me, and your impression of our business is important to us. We, we absolutely care about how you, your customer experience today. Will you share with us what happened? If that is what is conveyed, you're thinking like a collector. You're utilizing some of the display in order to give value to the content, and that's something you absolutely need to do. If you're just collecting reviews to collect reviews, I would suggest to you that you're, you're like a coin collector putting that valuable currency in a glass jar on a dusty shelf. If it's not being leveraged, it doesn't have value. Here's some ways you can leverage your reviews. I just wrote down some simple ideas, and there are a lot of them. Uh, these come from dealerships that are doing these things. You should be putting it in your email signature. Every email that goes out should have a link through to uh, reviews about you, about your business. You need to embrace that google S strategy. Recognize how strong review content shows up in search engine results page number one, that's SERP1. If you go Google your dealership, you will likely see reviews all over the place. 
I can tell you Dealer Raider shows up 87% of the time on a search for a business name only. If you add the keyword reviews to that, it goes up to 94. So, um, and we're just one player. There, there are other review sites out there, no doubt. I hope, I hope that you know that. Uh, you need to be paying attention to those as well. It is a holistic view here. Digital signage is a great idea in your service departments. Uh, I, I love the idea of a scrolling review. One of the things Megan Bartow did that, that is brilliant, um, she has digital picture frames on the desks of her salespeople, actually, and they load up just a few snapshots of some of the reviews, some of the customer letters they have, and those cycle right there on the desk. It's a great desk ornament, but it drives a conversation. Mr. Customer, I saw you looking at my reviews. I'm really proud of those. I, I hope I can earn one from you as well. Table tents, reminder cards, stickers on the RO that suggest that uh, an R, uh, that a uh, review would be welcome. These are all great things that you can do. Meet the staff pages on your website. I, I visit a lot of dealership websites, and, and frankly, I'm surprised at how many of them don't have a meet the staff page. What you're going to see in 2014 is more interest in the individual employee. The customer started by searching for the car. Then they started by searching for the car and the dealership. They've taken a step down. They're looking for the car, the dealership, and the employee. They want to know who they're going to, who they're talking to, when they're coming into the dealership. JD Powers has a number that they track of number of dealership visits pre-purchase. So every time, uh, you know, really that number has dropped every year. It's down to 1.8. So the consumer, according to JD Powers, is coming into 1.8 dealerships before they buy. They would like to buy at the first one. I, I can assure you of that. So what about negative reviews? Every time we do a, a discussion of reviews, this comes up, and I wanted to paint this picture for you. I hope this comes through in our webinar. But imagine yourself at the baseball stadium. You look up on the Jumbotron, and there you are, framed uh, nicely in the KISS cam, and here's what happened. I hope you can you can see the look on her face <laughs> as the gentleman sitting next to her, who she clearly did not come with, is uh, enjoying this beer when he's framed into the kiss cam. If you watch this enough times like I have, you can kind of see what happens in the audience, too. It's really interesting that the, the guy at the bottom, his uh, whole demeanor changes throughout the course of this short little video. Don't panic. Here's our takeaways. Don't panic. You need to be prepared. When you have a negative review, it shouldn't surprise you. You should have an action plan already in place. You need to know who's responding. You need to have a plan for how you're going to respond to those negative reviews. You need to recognize that a great response like this gentleman gives, it's infinitely better for your reputation than a negative review in the first place. There are a lot of great articles you can read about the power of negative reviews. I actually wrote a piece about that not too long ago as well. I'd be happy to send that to you. But uh, it, it really is a game changer. If you have a negative review that's handled well and responded to well, it will impact the crowd, which is our last piece. The crowd understands. Everybody has a crazy uncle in their life. They know that there are people out there that aren't going to be able to be satisfied no matter what you do. If you respond positively and in a high road manner to a negative review, you are really just proving the person that wrote it was that crazy uncle in their life. Okay. Uh, I would say this too, there, there are a lot of reputation management companies that start out a negative response uh, or a response to a negative review with an apology. And I am, I am not a fan of that. I, I don't love that strategy for a lot of reasons. I, I think that, uh, first of all, it may not be your fault. That a negative review may not have anything to do with anything you did. I talked to a gentleman from a dealership yesterday that they were running incentives. A customer came in and wanted to, wanted to cash buy on something that he wasn't eligible for and an incentive that they ran. It wasn't the dealership's fault that this person wrote a negative review. It was the person's fault. But um, it's the response that fixes that. So don't start with, a neg or with a, an apology. All that really does is, I think in some ways, it communicates that you did something wrong when you may not have. And secondarily, it communicates to that reviewer that uh, you're going to give them whatever it is they think they want. So I would, I would suggest that you not do that, just as an aside. Okay, last part. This is our don't, and it's don't take shortcuts. For any, uh, any baseball fans out there know that that number five Pujols jersey is a relic of a time gone by. When I did search for uh, Pujols jerseys, I found some other interesting alternatives to that one out there floating on the web. So I figured I'd share those with you as well. Albert Einstein has a quote, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. 
I think we need to uh, we need to think about that as we look at shortcuts. We we've all tried shortcuts that we've regretted later, and and uh, we've come to the point in the industry where we can recognize some failed strategies. And I wanted to quickly share those with you as you think about review collection, review stations. Uh, this this is a ship that has left the dock, folks. Uh, we don't need to be engaging in this any longer. It always created a questionable consumer experience. It was focused on quantity mainly over quality. We need to be focusing, as I talked about already, on the quality of the review, the story, not the star count. And lastly, it focuses on reviews as marketing. Reviews are so much more than your marketing. Uh, they can be marketed, but they are not in and of themselves marketing. If you are a general manager that's reading every review that comes in, you will get unique insight into your business and how different places operate from a consumer's experience. And that's really what one of the biggest value points to me of reviews is that it gives you that consumer insight that you would pay through the nose for if you were hiring focus groups. You get to see this right in, in your review feed. So definitely encourage you to think of, uh, of reviews not as marketing, but as something that can be marketed. Marketing agencies, this is another thing that, uh, that used to happen where we would mail out all of our CSI scores to a marketing agency that was like a sweatshop for review creation. Uh, that, again, has, has gone away. It's a quantity over quality issue, um, and it views reviews as marketing. Last one, fake reviews. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, this is something that uh, you're not considering, um, and please don't consider. There are, there are people that will try to take a shortcut that ends very, very badly for them. Google updated their terms of use. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide, but I would encourage you uh, in this. You should know the terms of use of any review site that you intend to collect reviews on. Be, I'll be a dealerator or Google or Yelp or any other. Read through their terms of use and make sure that your collection strategy actually meets with their expectations. When Google updated theirs, this actually happened at the same time they removed a lot of content. They removed a ton of content. And part of what they were doing there was resetting the stage. They needed a reset button because their terms of use didn't include some things that protected them as the content uh, provider from looking foolish, to be honest. So um, I would encourage you to read that terms of use. Everything that I've highlighted here in red supports the last three things that I've said. No review collection in store. Uh, that's clearly here in our conflict of interest. They don't want uh, employees or non-employees um, in writing reviews on behalf of a consumer. They don't want employees writing reviews on behalf of a consumer. And lastly, they say don't post, again, on behalf of anybody other than yourself. So recognize terms of use and that it will impact your success on different review sites. We could talk about Yelp. I know this is a challenge for a lot of dealerships with their filtering. Uh, I would encourage, I would love to have that conversation with you. It's not going to fit within the scope of uh, today's webinar. But um, please reach out to me if, if you're having challenges with Yelp. I'd love to talk with you more about some strategies for that. Astroturfing. This is a, uh, a baseball-themed word you need to be familiar with. And here's some uh, recent events out of the news. So Edmonds actually sued in August a company called Humankind. Uh, Edmonds caught them creating 2,200 fake accounts in order to write reviews on behalf of consumers or just write fake reviews to make the dealership look good. Yelp sued a, a law firm, actually, in September because that law firm was seeding Yelp's pages with fake reviews from non-existent clients. They were making up review content. And lastly, any dealers on New York pro or in New York probably know this. In September, late September, uh, New York actually sued 19 companies for fake reviews for posting on behalf of themselves and for actually supplying different businesses with fake reviews. They, they cracked down on it, and they actually assessed fines up to $350,000. That was the total sum. $350,000 spread across 19 different companies for fake reviewed content. So uh, a big deal. AstroTurfing, if, so if you're familiar with the term, is simply that. It's, uh, it is creating content that's faked. <clears throat> Folks, I, I think those are all Band-Aids. Uh, Band-Aid applications. Review stations are a Band-Aid. Fake reviews clearly are. Uh, Band-Aids don't cure cancer. And I hope, if nothing else, you learn from this webinar that it's a culture we're trying to drive. You need Nick Santisiro's and, and Megan Bartos. You need to create that culture within your store that rewards them and recognizes them for those excellent customer experiences. If our reputation management strategy, if what reputation management has come to mean is simply pushing down negatives and trying to have things removed. 
then uh, you're, you're fighting a losing battle because you may be able to cover up something with a Band-Aid, but you're not fixing the problem. You as a manager need to, uh, to continue with this analogy. You need to scrub in. You need to grab that scalpel and go look at where we're getting negative reviews. What, what's causing that? Is there any glimmer of truth to what's being said? And how can I impact that so that no other customers experience that same thing? You are the one that can fix it. It's not about applying a Band-Aid to cover up a problem. The way to a good reputation is to endeavor to be what you desire to appear, a Socrates quote. And that's exactly what we're talking about here, and that's what will bear out in that consumer experience. Remember what Nick said. Nick said, when I take good care of a customer, I don't have to worry about handing them a card. I want to hand them a card. It's when things don't go right, when there's a problem, when uh, we forget about their car and it sits for three hours and they leave mad, that's when something's going to, that's when I don't want to be asking for reviews. Talking about the three Ps, let me leave you with this, and we're coming to the end of the webinar time here. There are three Ps that impact you uh, when you talk about reputation, and I really think we can boil it down to that. Here's the first one. The dealership's reputation, it's yours to protect. You protect, you protect your, your reputation really by knowing what online reputation is, what reputation management really is. And again, it's, it's fixing those processes. It's, it's working with the customer so that we provide great customer experience. Management has to set those standards for that experience, both online and off. And then you have to hold your team accountable to those standards. What you, what you accept is what they will do. It's not what you say. It's what you accept. Uh, if, if you say, I want review content, and they don't provide it, and you accept that, then that's what their standard is. Not what you've told them the standard is, it's what you actually accept from them. Remember, the common opinion, the way in which people think about your dealership, must be an internal priority, and it has to be a priority worth protecting. The second P is to preserve. You preserve your reputation with that solid process to request reviews from customers. You have to have a process in place. Uh, whether that be in asking for reviews with the service advisors, handing out rating reminder cards, putting a sticker on the RO, emailing out you know, uh, a form. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this, but you have to have a process that you follow, and it needs to be consistently followed by everybody at your store. Second way you preserve your reputation, you need to monitor closely the reviews that you receive. Again, I think every review should go across management's desk. You need to not outsource that. Uh, there's no way you're going to impact what's happening in the store if you've outsourced your review strategy. You just won't. Uh, you won't know where things aren't working correctly unless you're reading those reviews as they come in. I really believe that uh, legitimate negative reviews are really often the, um, they're the result of a breakdown in a process. I believe we have good processes at the dealership. Sometimes they don't get followed. Uh, or sometimes situations happen that cause us to go outside of our process that doesn't create a great customer experience. Uh, that, that second P again, preservation, that should be a big part of what you do. It, it is the defensive aspect of reputation management from a customer experience standpoint. Last one is promote. We talked about this already. But promoting who you are as an organization, it, it's really always been a part of a successful dealership's marketing strategy. We've for years and years and years, dealerships have engaged in their community. They support the local baseball team. They, uh, they do fundraisers for organizations like Friends of Kids with Cancer. The, the dealership is an integral part of the community and, and really has been. So promoting who you are is a natural thing. What's changed is that now we do it online and we do it on review sites and we do it where customers have come to interact with us. But who you are is always going to drive what you do. And what you do is going to define who you are. That is a truth that won't change regardless of technology. Consumers do recognize they have a choice, and their choice is great right now. Uh, they can go to independent repair facilities. They can go to other dealerships that sell the same make as you. At the end of the day, it's that differentiation between you and your competitors, whether they be an independent repair facility or another dealership. That's what's worthy of your promotion. You have to be able to differentiate both online and off about the experience that you're going to provide. Uh, that, is the, that is the best success secret. In summary, make it personal. Remember, we make it personal by making it personal for the consumer and for the employee. We, we have to give them some personal reason to be interested in what we're asking them to do. Modify behavior. Think about those easy, simple, free ways that you can modify behavior. 
whether that be a high five when somebody does a good job, publicly recognizing a good review by sharing it across your, your whole organization. Those are extremely successful ways to modify behavior. And lastly, those three Ps. You want to protect, you want to preserve, and you want to promote your reputation. Those are the three things you need to do to have a real reputation management strategy. I want to thank you for your time. I know you have a, a lot of things you could be doing. And so you being here with me, uh, I hope was valuable to you. Again, my contact information is at the bottom of the page. I'd love to engage with you more on any of these topics. If you'd like to talk, don't hesitate to uh, send me an email. We'll set up time to, uh, to discuss that. And I certainly appreciate you being here. Thanks very much, and I hope you all have a good rest of the day.